So I'll talk a little bit today about the will of God. There'll be one more message after this. But uh, what got me thinking about this was uh, a question someone asked me some time back. Um, and an important question that really is, goes to the core of our being. His question was, what is life all about? An older person, she'd done well in life. She had a family. She had a very good career. He was healthy. He couldn't ask for more. But he was coming, he was getting old. He was retired from his work. And he asked that question, what was it all about? What's the purpose? What's the meaning of all the things that I've done? And I think younger people may not ask this question, but as you get older, you do, I think. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe young people do, but I'm asking that question more and more. You know, there is so little to look forward to if you're not a believer. Uh, when you're young, you know, you have big plans and goals and aims and dreams. And then as you come to the end of your days, whatever days God has given you, you will always ask that question. What's it been all, or what's it all been about? Why am I here? And some people will say, as I said, there really is no meaning at the end of, of the day. There is no purpose. We just keep busy. We do the things we are supposed to do or we do. And then at the end, the grave lies in front of us. And this is a question that has perplexed man for a long, long time. Man has been asking this and it's there in the scriptures as well. The words of the preacher the son of David, king in Jerusalem. What more could he have wanted? King in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Empty, meaningless. The result of all of Solomon's investigations with all his and research, with all the wisdom that God had given him, was that everything under the sun was futile, vanity, and meaningless. Life, he said, is transitory. It is fleeting, useless, empty. It has no meaning. Nothing, nothing in this earth <coughs> provides a valid goal for our existence. And this is important. If life has no meaning, when people, especially when people face difficult situations, when life is good and easy, we just go with the flow. But if life has no purpose, if life has no meaning, and I face, difficult, I face a difficult situation, what do I do? I'm going to turn to drugs. I'm going to turn to violence. That's what all these mass killings and violence is all about at the end of the day. Because these people have no purpose. They see no purpose and meaning in life. Or you end up with suicide. It may not even be a difficult situation when this can happen. And is what, did what Solomon says true? That it is all futile and meaningless? Yes, it's absolutely true. If this is all life is about, and death draws a final curtain on my life, what is life all about? You know, Mark Twain said this once. Often it does seem such a pity that Noah and his party did not miss the boat. Often it does seem such a pity, he says, that Noah and his party did not miss the boat. Because if Noah and his party had missed the boat, Mark Twain would not be existing. 
and he he thinks he would have been better off. And the Apostle Paul says, this reminds us that the whole creation is subject to futility, to vanity, to meaningless meaninglessness. The whole creation as a result of the entrance of sin. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. I never noticed this till when I was preparing for this. The creation was subject to meaninglessness, emptiness, futility, not will willingly, but because of God. Not creation's choice, not our choice. It is not our choice that there is meaninglessness or emptiness in our lives, but it is the decree of God. It is God who has brought that emptiness and meaninglessness into our lives. Why? Because we have disobeyed God. Because it says there, because of him who subjected it in hope. The only hope, the only meaning to be found in life, therefore, from that verse is this. To serve God and to know what is the will of God in our lives. Maybe that is why the, the name Abel, Adam's second son, it means vapor or vanity. Maybe Adam, as, as a result, as a consequence of what had happened in the Garden of Eden, he came out, he's getting older, and a second son is born to him. And his conclusion is life is just a vapor. It is meaningless. It has no meaning, no purpose. And I will call my son Abel. Yes, I think if we look at it, Solomon is right. All is vanity under the sun. But at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon comes to this conclusion. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and his commandments. Or his will. His will are his commandments. For that is man's all. Not part. Not 50%. Not 90%. That is man's all. The basic elements that make for a full and joyful life that gives meaning, meaning and purpose to man is to follow God. Now, other people will say, people will give you different reasons for life, for living. Some people will say it is so that we can be happy. The purpose of man on this earth is to be happy. And please read this in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the Declaration of Independence implies that the purpose of man's life is to pursue happiness. But it says the word pursuit. It does not say that among these are the pursuit of life, no, or the pursuit of liberty. It only says the pursuit of happiness. And they were right. We are chasing after vapor. Happiness is something really, there are moments of peace and happiness, but Happiness is elusive. It's like a vapor, here today, gone tomorrow. Life, yes. We can say, I have life for 50 years, 60 years, whatever. What can I say about happiness? We just pursue it. There are moments we get it, but we soon lose it. Others will say, 
And this is interesting. This is what the atheist will say. Our purpose in life is to survive. To survive so that we can procreate and ensure the survivability of the human species. And they point to the natural wild world, wild, the wild world. From the day animals, wild animals are born, it is a battle for survival until the day they die. Happiness does not come into it. Morality does not come into it. You survive. And whatever is at, at your means, at your disposal, you fight to survive. And that is the purpose of man's life. That is sad. But what do the scriptures say? What does God have to say about all these things? And the people will give you other different reasons. Other people will say the purpose of life is to uh, do good and so on. And these are all, some of these are good reasons. But is that really what it is? The scriptures say that clearly we were not created for the pain and the suffering and the unhappiness that surround us. We were not created to ensure the survival of the human species. But God's creation of man and woman was his exceptional work. And yet so what's so amazing is man is so insignificant. In this vast universe, what is man? The psalmist says. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man? What is man? A speckle of dust in this universe of God? But then the psalmist continues. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. The purpose of life. The only conclusion we can come to is this. And we, when we read the book of Genesis and what's it in the book of Psalms. That human beings are God's most important work. His masterpiece in this universe that he has created. The universe is vast. I don't know how many light years it takes to go from one star to another. Light years is the, the, uh, if we travel at the speed of light. How many light years it will take us. And still, the psalmist says, What is man that thou visitest him, and the son of man that thou art mindful of him? And he carries on, you, are, you have crowned him with glory and honor, more than the universe or any planets or anything else that's out there. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And the psalmist says, What the psalmist is saying is this God's original purpose for men and women is this. That they should occupy a position of glory, authority, honor in his creation. That is the meaning of life. That was the purpose that God intended for us. And that is God's desire for us. What is God's desire for us? Here is a verse. For it became him, in him for whom are all things. In bringing many sons unto glory. His great purpose was this. Bringing us unto glory. The truth is, we are special to God. We are very special to God. There is no doubt whatsoever about, no doubt whatsoever about God's intention for us. And his God plans to live with us, with man, forever. So this really is man's purpose and meaning in life. To live in the fear of God. To follow his will. To serve him. Otherwise, it is all vanity of vanities. It is futile. It is empty. It is meaningless. You want to find people who, are, who, who think well, life is meaningless? Just go out and pretty much ask anybody. So what, I, what is the will of God for us? Whatsoever you do, whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Is there any glory 
for God in what I do? And that's the question we should be asking ourselves. What brings glory to God? And I think, of course, the best example, the one person we can look at is the life of the Lord Jesus. This is what he said. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He did it all to the glory of God. In all his thoughts and words and deeds, he glorified the Father. No thought, no word, no deed that did not glorify his Father. He glorified the Father by sinless life. He glorified his Father by his miracles. He glorified his Father by, what he, by his conversations and by what he shared and spoke to the people. He glorified God by his, his Father by his death by suffering, by his resurrection. And when we look at that prayer in John 17, we see examples, or in, we, we can see in how we glorified the Father in this prayer. He said, he manifested the Father's name in verse 6 of John 17. He gave them the words from the Father. He kept his own. By keeping his own, he had glorified the Father. He had declared the Father's name, and so on he goes on in that chapter. And how did he take that glory? How did he bring that glory about? I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So he glorified the Father by doing the will of the Father. And then it carries on. And Jesus said unto them, My meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So his food was to do the will of God, to finish the work which God had given him to do. Food is everything. If I don't have food, I'm dead. I'm not going to live for long. Without food, one will die. This was how important it was to the Lord to do the will of the Father. It was his meal, his sustenance, his food. So his, his food was two, twofold. To do the will of the Father, to finish the work of the Father, so that the Father would be glorified. His sustenance. It was this, the will of him that sent him, the will of the Father that sustained him, that kept him going day by day. He lived for it. He lived by it. It was his meat. His stable food. That's all his life was about. He had no other ambition. He had no other goals. He had no other desires. It was the will of the Father. So the psalmist, the Lord says this. We can we see this about the Lord. And we, and we read this in Hebrews also. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yeah, thy law is within my heart. It was his delight. So, and these words are quoted in Hebrews 10, and it suggests a joyful activity, not some gloomy acceptance, something I delight in, something I enjoy in. He enjoyed, he delighted to do the Father's will. God's will is not something to be endured. It is something to be enjoyed. Whatever it may cost, it may cost. There's a price to it. But it is something that will delight our hearts. May it become our delight. May we say, I delight to do thy will. Now, this does not mean that the Lord Jesus did not have his own will. This does not mean he was a robot who was sort of manipulated by God. No, that he was programmed. No, what he had was he had his own will. But his will was in perfect agreement with the will of his father. It's a question for us. Is our will in agreement, in synchrony with the will of God? 
he recognized that doing, doing God's will not something that was incidental. It was not an option. It was not a possibility in life. It was his whole, ob whole object. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. What was his final cry on the cross? It is finished. I have finished. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. It is finished. That was the final cry. What is our food? What is our sustenance? What is our will? What really matters to us? What defines us at our core? What delights us? Can I say my food is to do the will of God? Can I say I want, my, I want to finish the work which God has given me to do? Can I say I want to bring glory to his name? Can I really say that? To be honest, I don't think I can. Now, we may say, okay, I want to do the will of God. But what is the will of God? If I knew it, I'll do it. Now, Islam means submission to the will of God. And it's rather sad. It's a passive acceptance. A, health, a, a helpless resignation when you observe that religion to, the dispos to, uh, to their God and a hope for the best. That's it. Is that what our, that is what our submission to the will of God is? No. It is not some passive acceptance or a helpless resignation. No, it is, no. We submit to God's will. Why? Because God has a plan and a purpose for us. We are active participants in the purposes of God. We are not just res resigned and uh, we are just sort of kind of letting fate take over. God is working through us. We are active participants. Something else about the Lord Jesus that, that, was, uh, that was quite interesting, I thought. He said, I seek, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So this says, he's not just waiting for something to happen. He's seeking out the will of God. He's looking for it. He's searching for it. Do we see God's will like that? Do we have that desire to see, to find out, to search God's will? Here's a, uh, oh, I didn't have, uh, I didn't write this down. But here, here he says, he, at, at, the, um, at the cross, knowing all that the cross meant, and he, was, he prayed there in the garden for the cup to be removed, uh, for the removal of the cup of judgment, but he could say, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And what is that? That was saying it was his choice. He made a choice that God's will would be done. We can say that we can say that God's will be done. It is not because it is necessary. We are not forced to do God's will. It is our choice. We seek for it, and it is our choice. Mm -hmm. So this then should be the Christian's attitude to the will of God. We seek it out. It is delightful. It is our choice. It is our meat. It is everything to us. But how can we know what that will of God is? In Ephesians, we read understanding what the will of the Lord is. But sometimes it seems it is harder than accomplishing. I would do it if I knew it, we may say. But the Lord has an answer. In John 7, 17, it says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So, the Lord Christ is saying here, 
Look, if you do the will of God, what is known of the will of God, you will know of what I'm teaching. You will know what I'm what I'm teaching, what, what I'm revealing of the Father to you. You will know what is the will of God. So our knowledge of God's will, our knowledge of God's will depends then on our doing of what we already know of God's will. So our knowledge of God's will will depend not just on reading what's in scripture. That will, that will op open God's will to us, but also doing what we already know and being ready to do what may still be unknown. And we will later on, not today, but see examples of scriptures of, of men and women of God where this has happened. So it is not just cold definitions. It is not just words that we read from scripture. Knowing the will of God means doing the will of God that he has already revealed to us. Now God's will is quite is stated quite clearly in certain respects. Some things are very clear, black and white. God's will is to have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of truth. This is God's desire. The one other version puts it like, who willeth or desires that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. This is God's will. But some may reject God's purposes and grace. So it is not God's will that stops men and women from getting saved. This is very clear. God wills that all men to be saved. It is not God's will, therefore, that stops men and women from getting saved. It is man's rejection of God. And this verse continues. To come to the knowledge of truth. So it is God's desire that, that all should come to the knowledge of truth. So when a sinner comes to Christ, he's not only saved. He has come to the one who is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. One commentator puts it like, put it like this. He finds in Christ truth absolute. Truth is so important. I thought about this a little bit. There's fake and misleading news all over the place now. For example, related to medical treatments, major diseases like cancer or diabetes. If you treat this as truth, you're going to be, make decisions that are harmful to your health. Now, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence. It's all over the place now. One of the biggest problems in AI is truth. A lot of money is being poured into what's called trustworthy artificial intelligence. Don't trust these systems. Not only that, do we know the truth? I thought about that. Do I know the truth? What's the difference when it comes to a machine learning or, or an AI program? And these AI programs try to mimic the brain by having neural networks in them. And me, do I know the truth? I don't think I do. There is no truth outside of Christ. I can know no truth. I really don't think, think I can. I thought about this a little bit. It's maybe subjective, relative. I can, I can see creation and I can come to certain truthful conclusions. But there is one only, as we said. He finds in Christ truth absolute. So the only truth is in Christ. And so this really raises two questions for each one of us. Am I accepting God's will by trusting in Christ for salvation? Do I know 
the Lord as my Savior, because this is God's will for all of us. And here's the second question. Am I making this part of his will mine also? Am I making part of his will mine also? That I desire all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that my will? Is that my desire? And then we read it is also uh, as part of God's will that those who are saved by faith in Christ should never be, lo be lost, but they will also have everlasting life. And there are verses for that which I've listed, which I've got here, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, I will just um, 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 go through this quickly. So those who, the Father's will, God's will is that we should see the Son, believe in Him, and we should have eternal life. And this gives meaning and purpose to life. Doesn't mean I'm coming to the end of my life. Therefore, there's really no, what was it all about? I don't have to ask that question. In fact, my best days are ahead of me. And that means life is worth living. I may be going through an extremely difficult time, but my best days lie ahead. There is no need for me to harm myself. Here's something else that is God's will. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. In other words, I must make it a purpose in my life to live a life that is sanctified, a holy life set apart for God. Now we have positional sanctification where, um, uh, where we have been set apart from the world because it is perfect and complete, sanctified in the Lord Jesus. But there's also that sanctification where believers must sanctify themselves, that they must separate themselves from all forms of sin in our daily lives. And this is known as practical or progressive sanctification. And this is a process that will continue until the believer's death or the, or the Lord's return. So this is the sanctification that's talked about here, that practical sanctification that goes on in our daily lives. And again, this goes back to what I said here. We get this by how? By doing the will of God. So personal sanctification, holiness in our lives comes by, by us walking with him, doing what we already know is the will of God. And whatever is unknown, we are ready for it to follow him. Then we have this in Thessalonians. Rejoice evermore. Pray without season. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is the will of God. To rejoice. To pray. To be thankful. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And joy can be the constant experience of the Christian. Because of the purpose and the meaning we have in life even in the most adverse of circumstances. Because Christ is the source of that joy. He's the subject of the joy. And at the end of the day, he's in control of everything, no matter what we are going through. I may have mentioned this before, but uh, Francis Collins, he led the Humo he Human Genome Project. He was the former director of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health serving under three presidents. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of, Scientist, uh, of Science. Now I was, going, I was looking at the website and atheists and evolu evolutionists was, were, who had huge articles on why he should have never been head of the NIH, why she should have never received these uh, medals because he was not a scientist, because he was a Christian. It's amazing. When I, when I looked at what's been written out there. But he was head of the NIH and he had the Human Genome Project. So he finished his graduate degree in quantum mechanics at Yale, I think, and, but he went through a uh, um, personal crisis because he did not want to do that for the rest of his life. So he decided to go to medical school. He was an atheist. He did not believe in God, yet he wanted nothing to do with God. 
And so this is what he said. This was in an interview with NPR. So it was really as a medical student and later as a resident encountering the realities of what disease and the specter of death does to human beings that I began to wonder about this. Some of my patients were clearly relying very heavily on their faith as a source of strength in circumstances that were pretty awful. They had terrible diseases from which they were probably not going to escape. And yet, instead of railing at God, they seemed to lean on their faith as a source of great comfort and reassurance. They weren't somehow preserve, perceiving it as the reality, as the really awful thing that it seemed to me to be. And he says, that was interesting. That was puzzling. It was unsettling. And then his scientist mind brain kicks into action. He says, as I began to ask a few questions of these people, I realized something very fundamental. I had made a decision to respect any faith tree of the world without ever really knowing what it was I had rejected. And that worried me. As a scientist, you're not supposed to make decisions without the data. It was clear to me, it was pretty clear, I hadn't done any data collecting here about what faith stood for. The scientist had come to a conclusion without collecting any data. And so he started collecting the data. And that a young as a, as a young man, he went from atheism to Christianity after seeing how radically his patient's faith transformed their experience of suffering. This is rejoicing. This is God's will for us. Then it continues, we should be in the spirit of prayer. And this is in co a conscious communion with God. Whatever it, wherever we happen to be, whatever our situation, this is God's will. At home, at work, in the gathering of the saints, or wherever. And thanksgiving. You know, thanks. I feel that sometimes that thanksgiving is, people giving thanks is sort of uh, not as common as it used to be when I was younger. I may be wrong. You know, when you get older, your memory is not so good. But, uh, but I feel that people think that society and the state and the government owe them, owe them more. That sense of independence, that my life, what I make of my life is my responsibilities seems to be not as it used to be. Um, that, you know, I really don't have to thank anyone. Whatever I have is because of what I've done and, you know, any problems I have are really someone else's fault. But did the Lord Jesus give thanks? Oh, yes, he did. Many occasions. In John 4, 11, 14, we read, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee. It says here, we are not to give thanks for everything. No, no. Sometimes it's very difficult to give thanks in some circumstances, but it is to give thanks in everything. In everything. Whether in trials, in persecutions, in bereavement, we can give thanks. And only when the complete pattern of our lives, only when the pathway, when the direct, only when the, the way our life has gone is revealed one day, we will be able to see God's divine plan for each one of us. We don't see it now. And finally, last point, this is God's will to do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So foolish men, there'll be criticisms, there'll be opposition, there'll be persecution, there'll be accusations. What do we do? The will of God is that we answer them by good works. Not just, by, by, by not just good words, but doing good. And that is God's will for us. So the key is this. The key to knowing what's God's will is to yield to his known will, what he has told us. And we have been through some of them here. And as we know and do the will of God, as he's clearly revealed to us, we will see God making our pathways clear and his will for us 
in other areas which may not be so clear from scripture. Let us start with what we know. Let us yield to his known will and do it. And this gives us meaning and purpose in life. This is what we live for, or we should live for. This should be our food, our meat. And when we are set on doing what's God's will, as it says in Romans chapter 12, we will prove, we will show, we will demonstrate that it is good and acceptable and perfect. Life is good. Life is wonderful as a believer. Life means something. We, and there is real purpose and meaning in life. If it wasn't for, for if it wasn't for what God has given us, has put in us, at the end of the day, life would have very little purpose or meaning. And I hear that so many times. What is life all about? God is good. His will for us is good, acceptable, and perfect. Next time I'll look at some, uh, some examples from scripture on how God worked through men to reveal his will for them.